So you may have noticed the past couple of weeks on Sundays that the bulletin cover has been printed in color. And if you haven't noticed that, I'm pointing it to you now. Um, and we we have a new printer, and that's why we're able to do that. And it helps sometimes the pictures that have been printed there in black and white aren't so easy to see, but in color we can see them more clearly. Um, this, this evening, I'm going to invite your attention to the cover of the bulletin now. That's a painting. It's called The Nativity with St. Francis and St. Laurent. Um, they are um, saints that were um, later, came later. They were like in the 16th century. And the painting was painted by a, an artist that we know um, as Car- Caravaggio. Caravaggio lived in the 1600s. And so typical to Renaissance artists and also um, to many um, artists still today, when they paint the nativity, they dress the people up in clothes to, that are current to them. So these people are dressed as if they were living in the 1600s. People who would paint a nativity today might be, you know, dressing them in, in jeans and t-shirts or tennis shoes and slacks. Who knows what the artist might consider um, these days. But a couple of things about this painting. Um, what I noticed right away is the centrality. You know, there's Joseph and Mary. Mary looks exhausted. Looks like she really just gave birth, doesn't she? She looks tired. And then there's the baby Jesus. And then the rest of the people are gathered around, just gathered into the light. And there's a contrast between the light and the darkness. In fact, the style that Caravaggio uses is one that does that. It accentuates the darkness in the painting so that those things that are in the light really kind of pop out at you. So you see those things clearly. Immediately, your eyes are drawn to the light. It's interesting that Caravaggio would use this technique, pointing out the darkness. You know, when I saw it, I thought, you know, you forget, don't you? You forget in a world in which you drive down, came here. And you saw the street lights, you saw the houses lit up, you saw the Christmas decorations. You forget how six, you know, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was born, there weren't street lights. There weren't Christmas lights. There weren't lights the way we know them. You know, they, they didn't have you know, lamps in their houses. They didn't have TV screens that illumine the whole room. They didn't have light-up shoes for little kids so you can find your kids in the dark. They didn't have all of that light. In fact, it was either darkness or the light of lamps at nighttime. So it was very dark when these events that Luke describes happened. There was a darkness that seemed to threaten to swallow up up everyone at that time. It was dark. And this time of year, particularly, the shortest day, light hours of the year have just gone by. It is dark outside. Imagine how dark it was then. You know, I've been to Herod's palace um, right outside of Bethlehem, between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. It's called the Herodian. Funny that he would name a place after himself. But the Herodian is this huge fortress that overlooks the Judean hills. So it's very likely that Herod might have been at his palace when Jesus was born. And if that's the case, there would have been extra guards on the fortress walls. It's interesting that with all of that, that those guards on the wall, all they saw was the darkness. Somehow they missed the angels tearing through the night and lighting up the sky for those shepherds not too far away. Somehow the darkness swallowed up those men on that wall that night. Sometimes it seems that darkness is going to win, doesn't it? But we remember the words that Isaiah spoke, those words that we incorporated into our 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 litany this morning, this evening rather, that those people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Upon them has brightness, has light dawned. So Caravaggio has the light in the center, the light that draws you towards itself. But the darkness is still there. It's interesting. 
Caravaggio, those of you who have had an art, an art history class can maybe correct me a little bit, but Caravaggio was not the nicest guy. He was known as a scoundrel, a cheat. He was known as a heavy drinker. He lived hard. He drank hard. You might say in the parlance of the day that he was rode hard and put away wet. And aside from his brilliant talent, he's also remembered because he killed a man and spent the rest of his life fleeing from the law, fleeing from the man's family and their vendettas. Fleeing. The guilt was so much upon him. He died at age 37, which even for the Renaissance is is kind of a young age. I mean, Tom Brady hadn't retired the first time yet at that age. Caravaggio dies. Darkness seems to be on the fringe, not just of Caravaggio's life, but also this painting. This painting, this is a duplicate, a, a, a copy of the painting because it used to hang in the chapel of St. Francis's Church in Palermo, Italy. And in 1969, somebody broke into the church and cut the picture out of the altarpiece. So this is a painting that is probably like 10 feet by 12 feet, and somebody came in and stole the painting. It's gone. And the rumor is that perhaps it was destroyed by the thief, that when he couldn't sell it or she couldn't sell it, if you can't can't have it, nobody can, might have taken over in their heart, and the painting was destroyed, probably. Darkness even swallowed up the painting. Darkness seems to be everywhere. And yet, and yet tonight we celebrate the fact that darkness doesn't win, don't we? We celebrate, as John wrote, the light shines on in the darkness and the darkness doesn't win. The darkness can't grab hold of it, can't dominate it, can't put it out. And that's great news for us. Because as the angels tore through the darkness that night, so also the light that is Jesus shines for us still tonight. So if you, like Caravaggio, have some guilt that is grabbed hold of your life, that has grabbed hold of your life and has left you as somebody on the run, whether physically or emotionally or spiritually, tonight, remember the good news the angels sang, the one who is born of Mary, the one who has come into our flesh to be the God and man together, the one who has come to not only start a new humanity, but to start that new humanity with his death and resurrection on the cross so that your guilt, my guilt, could be taken care of by his sacrifice, by his death for us, and swallowed up, not by the darkness, but by his resurrection, that the grave is swallowed up in his victory. So if your darkness is a different darkness. Maybe you don't have a darkness of guilt, but maybe there's a shadow of conflict tonight. You know, the holidays bring out the wonderful part of family, but also that other part. You know, that part where 20 years ago people stopped speaking to each other because of something that happened, something that was said, something that was done. And 20 years later, they haven't spoken yet. I know what that looks like in my family. It is painful, but it is also a darkness that creeps into every relationship in your family. So tonight, if your darkness is one rooted in conflict, rooted in anger, rooted in some family issue, some personal conflict that you're having with a neighbor or someone else, Know the darkness doesn't win because the babe has been born. The light has come into the world. The one of whom the angels sang, that for there will be peace on earth. That this one who Isaiah says is the prince of peace has come for you to shine his light into your darkness and suspel it. And maybe, maybe tonight your darkness is a different shade. Maybe it's rooted in loneliness. 
Maybe you're one of those people. Because of whatever's happened, maybe you're out here by yourself because the job was out here and you moved out first. Maybe you're out here by yourself feeling alone in the crowd because there's just this empty space that calls for being filled and you're trying to find whatever it is you can stick in that hole because the loneliness is so huge. Or maybe your loneliness is despair. Maybe you're just sad, overwhelmed by sorrow, overwhelmed by loss tonight. Maybe that despair is threatening to be the darkness that swallows you. As a little girl told me one time back in Colorado talking about her dad, that my dad got so lost in the woods that he couldn't find his way back home. Maybe you're lost in the woods tonight in the darkness of despair. Again, the good news is that the light has come. The angels sang, joy, joy to the earth, joy to the nations of the earth, joy because this baby has been born for you, for me, for all of us. The baby has come, the one who is born for us, the one who is light wrapped up in human form, the light of God shining in the darkness. And the darkness doesn't win because this baby has come. You know, darkness doesn't have to be in such big shades like despair and loneliness, conflict, or guilt, does it? You know what it is to be. Maybe you've been outside on a summer's evening, maybe reading, maybe just sitting out watching the world go by. And the sun is gradually setting, and your eyes get more and more used to the dark. So pretty, pretty much you don't even know just that it's dark now because your eyes have gotten adjusted to it. And you're still pretending you can read. You're still pretending you can see just fine. You're still pretending that everything is light. You've convinced yourself that darkness is light. It's so easy for us to get easily adjusted to darkness in our lives, darkness in our world. And when you're adjusted that way and somebody comes in and turns the light on, oh, it hurts. And I'm sure when those shepherds were sitting, minding their own business, minding their sheep that night, minding their flocks by night, and suddenly heaven was torn open and angels came tumbling out and there was this festival of light as all the angels gathered themselves together around the news that Jesus had been born. I'm sure that light overwhelmed them, burned their eyes perhaps, as it does when anyone turns on a light when you're in a dark room, but it hurts. It hurts to know that Jesus has come to be Savior because if he has come to be Savior, you and I need saving. We can't do it by ourselves. There's something that separates us from God, and that something is our, that darkness that would claim us, that sin that would tease our hearts to con- make us think that there is no darkness, but it claims 